This is Free Speech, a Suffolk Libraries podcast series which celebrates libraries' rebellious history as spaces for free learning and freedom of speech. Each episode we invite an artist or professional we admire to take the mic. They tell us about their life and work, their triumphs, tribulations and their hopes and fears. Suffolk Libraries is a charitable organisation which runs the county's library service. We also have a thriving arts programme, generously funded by Arts Council England. This is Free Speech. Enjoy the podcast. My name is Shabnam Shabazi. I am an interdisciplinary artivist. That's an artist and activist. A maker and enabler of creative projects, working across a range of art forms through a solo and collaborative arts practice. In my solo practice, I work with objects, video, text, performance and installation. In my collaborative practice, working with artists and non-artists in different communities, spotlighting them and enabling their interests. Participation and creating platforms, giving voice to important issues are central to my practice, which is animated by the interstices and intersections between art forms and cultures. Exploring notions of site-specific, subverting the use of existing spaces and committed to a without-walls approach with a strong outreach and engagement practice. Let me describe my practice a little more. My background is in theatre, new writing actually, as a director. I did that successfully from 14 to 32 and in 2002 I got archive fever when my grandmother died. The philosopher Jacques Derrida talks about this in his book Mal d'Archive. My grandmother's death was a big transformative moment, as death is for many of us, especially the death of someone really close. Her death was a game changer for me, for my work and practice, as I became preoccupied with excavating my family archive and making work from it. My grandmother was the head of the household. So long as she was around, I had no need to ask who or where I was in the world. There was a natural connection between us and she treated me like her youngest daughter. Her death catapulted my archive fever and suddenly I needed to know more. So essentially, this all started as a Who Am I project. My solo practice is archival and autobiographical. But in a conceptual way, I work with my memories as my documents, revisiting the site of traumatic and painful moments. I literally re-inhabit and re-enact different significant moments, repeating rituals, actions and gestures, as Louise Bourgeois talks about. There are too many gaps, cracks, distances and fissures. I cannot access my ancestry as tangibly since I have grown up displaced in the West with the mainstream society making no meaningful attempts to really know me or represent me or my history on the curriculum or anywhere else. As Erica Badu says... No, you won't be naming no buildings after me. My name will be misstated. I can really relate to this. So I have to revisit, re-inhabit, recreate, reconstruct to find ways of uh, ensuring that I'm represented and visible. Displacement age two or three, parental divorce, babies having babies in the name of tradition, culture. Culture is an excuse to stop progress. I cross cultures, I cross waters, movement, story of my life, never in one place. My feet are sore, 
always walking, never arriving. What you're hearing here is Speaker's Corner, a performative installation I created. Speaker's Corner is uh, inspired by my experiences of being forced to leave Iran at the height of the Iranian revolution of uh, 1979 with my mum, grandmother and aunt. I was nine. I needed to revisit this moment. It was a a process of uh, revisiting the matriarchal family archive, reconnecting with family I hadn't seen since the age of nine, uh, interviewing family members and friends, um, doing different actions as part of the process inspired from my own history or memory, um, as well as leading my own independent research, uh, working with my own memories and personal uh, archives. Every component of this project was personal, uh, even the items in the car. Uh, and the car became like a living museum where you entered and you could look through everything that was there, the objects, the documents, albums, video you could watch with headphones. And at the same time, and significantly, there was this three-way sound in the car, changing narrative, my voice coming from the front speakers of the the car, amplified, telling you a story, and two other sound sources in the back of the car, my mum's voice looped, uh, saying a sentence about arriving in the UK and what it was like. And the reason it's called Speaker's Corner is because my mother and grandmother used to be speakers there and I used to tag along every Sunday. It was like Speaker's Corner was my playground in those early years of arriving as a a political refugee kid in um, London. When you enter, you hear my voice speaking my truth and telling the story from my personal perspective. Displacement, age nine, loss of the fatherland, February 7th, 1979, a month before my ninth birthday. The Iranian woman at the anti-war rally said, the Iranian revolution was the most democratic revolution. Stupid woman. There is no such thing as a democratic revolution. We all know that. I'm one of the children of the revolution. All revolutions are bloody. There are two types of reaction. One is revolution. One is subversion. I prefer subversion. No electricity for weeks. School disrupted. Playing bingo in the dark. People shouting from the rooftops. One day, I came home from school. A sign on the door. Furniture for sale. People strolling. Buying things like a department store. What was happening? No one spoke to me. Let me talk in more detail about this time in my life and what I actually experienced. From 1978, we knew Iran was troubled. There were protests all over the country. Electricity kept cutting out. There were disruptions to everything. School kept shutting. Food shortages resulting in rations and long queues. The Shah secret police are breaking into our homes due to governmental censorships being imposed, particularly on the books of Sadr Hedayat, uh, which were made illegal. Um, random things kept happening. Our next door neighbours informed on us to the Ayatollah's secret police as they were pro the revolution and knew that my mother and grandmother were politically active and against the Ayatollah's revolution. We had no choice but to leave our house very abruptly as our lives were in danger. This is in January 1979. My mum and my grandmother's name were on the wanted list at the central cemetery Behesht Zahra, where also they had built a fountain uh, flowing red water to symbolise blood. And attached to it, there was 
a board with a list of names uh, of people that they wanted to catch to execute um, out on public display. You see, my matriarchs were feisty women, lionesses, not scared of anything or anyone, able to defend themselves. Even at the time, this was quite unusual uh, in Iran to be all a family of uh, women with no men. During this time, for several weeks, we had nowhere to live and we had to live in a car with my mum, grandma, aunt, pet dog, cat and goldfish. Uh, this is why I chose the site of a car for my uh, performance installation. Uh, we left uh, Iran on the last flight out before the airports closed down for a long time. Um, this was on the 7th of February 1979. Ironically, the personal is totally political here, as this is also the eve of my dad's birthday. Um, we arrived in the UK in the winter of discontent, um, 8th of February 1979, uh, as uh, Prime Minister Callaghan is being overthrown by Margaret Thatcher. And this is the beginning of the end for me uh, in terms of the birth of the neoliberal project. We couldn't live in our house anymore. My mum and grandma's name were on the wanted list. Our next door neighbour, once my best friend, now our arch enemies, chased us out for fear of our lives. A modern witch hunt, three generations of women, three women and a little girl fled into the darkness. The streets, volatile, aggressive, too much testosterone, disappeared, repression, control. A society that represses men, silences women. I want to talk to you a little about uh, my mother and my grandmother and their history and influence on me. I grew up with my aunt, mother and grandmother, so this is what I'm born into. Um, I have only ever seen women doing stuff in my household as I had three mums, essentially. My mother was married off at 13 and my grandmother was wed at 12 before she had even started her periods. Their childhoods robbed, though the concept of childhood is probably also a Western concept. And even in this country, until fairly recently, we were sending children down the mines. My grandmother had four husbands. For one reason or another, none of the marriages worked out each ending under really traumatic circumstances uh, with children being robbed from my grandmother as the fathers had more force and authority. Um, when I performed in Carol Churchill's Top Girls at university, I learned about other women through history whose children had been robbed from them and taken away, um, especially when the women rejected their husbands and no longer wanted to be with them. So I see my mother and my grandmother as victims of a patriarchal system of the past that was supposedly better, but it still repressed women and prioritised men. And fundamentally, in my opinion, nothing much has changed though certainly the situation in Iran and um, everywhere has deteriorated. How this history has affected me is that I'm totally a feminist and I do not believe in marriage and see it as part of the patriarchal system. I see my mother and grandmother as victims of the regime before, which they don't even question and accept blindly as their birthright. They cannot see that it is patriarchal and imposed by men, or at least that seems acceptable for them, but not me. 
Unfortunately, today, Iran has become an extremely archaic, patriarchal and misogynistic society where women are regarded as secondary to men by the systems and structures that exist. As we have been exposed in recent times, women cannot even go to sports events. Basic civil liberties are removed in the eyes of the law, favouring and supporting the man. When I arrived in UK, without a word of English, I felt like I was underwater, like a baby mermaid learning the ropes. The rope of my ancestry entwined round my neck like the forceps baby I was. Tethered, dislocated, severed, a ship sailing in my stomach, damaged, water seeping in, the ship sinking with all its passengers. Trying to fit in, new way, new life. We thought we were going back, three weeks at the most, as soon as things calm down. The passage of time, time plays tricks, tick tock. You cannot silence us, you cannot silence us, you cannot silence us, you cannot silence me. Shout back. Daddy can't see me, no freedom to cross any borders, he needs a letter of invitation, we are looked upon as terrorists. Illegal immigrant, leave to remain, political asylum, then one day, swear oath to the Queen, to be good citizens, British citizenship, assimilate to accumulate. I've been in UK since 1979 and what I learn is from the perspective of being in the UK and the UK press, which is heavily censored. So that is all I know. Iran is a country that has been at war, which has been colonised by British and Americans. Iran is British Petroleum's first project. And the reason we are in this mess is because of Western interference. Years of colonization and imperialism. We would not be here if UK and US and other Western countries were not so greedy in the first place. And it's the same story in one way or another right across the world. I have been blessed to work extensively right across the UK in African, Caribbean, Asiatic and culturally diverse communities. So I've had this debate and even held long tables on it. Generally, I would say that culturally most black and brown women connect with womanism as opposed to feminism. If you break down what feminism is and clarify that it is about women's rights, then it becomes more accessible. But feminism is a Western concept. But as I say, in the East, if you define it in terms of women's rights and equalities for women, then it will become accessible. And for sure, it does exist. There is not an official term for it in my mother tongue, just terms like rights of women or freedom of women or equalities for women. I definitely identify as a feminist myself, but feminism I learned here in the West, coming here, gaining my own consciousness, reading my first degree in philosophy with strong feminist thinkers and writers like Kate Soper, gaining perspective on my maternal history through a new feminist lens on my terms and self-identifying as a feminist aged 19. What stereotype do you have of me? Are you surprised that my family speak fluent English? What do you think of me when I go by? I get asked at least once a day, where are you from? Do I look Hispanic? Can I be other? You can't quite place me. I am Anglo-Indian, I am Turkish, I'm Pakistani Indian, Spanish, exotic, sometimes Italian, ethnic, 
South American. No, I am not Arabic. I speak Farsi. From everywhere other than the place where I'm from. I want to speak a little about my research into body as house and perceptions around the female body and <clears throat> my body and my body politics. First, a little background. Um, when I migrated from theatre to performance art, live art, uh, mentored by artists like Franco B, Ron Athey, Guillermo Gomez Pena and Julie Tolentino, all of whom work with the nude body intrinsically. Uh, going intrinsically beyond the body is an essential aspect of performance art. You cannot do performance art and not have to confront yourself and your body in some way. My body is exotic and objectified as a woman from my heritage. I was very concerned about showing my naked body in performance as I was animated by wishing to revisit Iran from 2004 to 2011, this was. Women must have themselves fully covered and to be honest, this is how it's been for a long time, though I hear it's a bit more relaxed now. But certainly if you go as a diasporic child, you are more sensitive to this because you're the English gal coming in and they can tell right away. Um, so I had this inbuilt fear around this and it was a real thing uh, for all Iranians at and it's illegal. Even though I have a British passport and have grown up in the UK, uh, that doesn't matter as it's misogynistic and patriarchal. The father rules. If your father is Iranian, then you're regarded as Iranian. Your mother's opinion or inclusion does not matter. Remember, uh, talking to my um, step brother about nudity some 18 years ago and at that time he said that if the regime comes across any photos of you naked then all you would have to do is make a public apology and they would forgive you. I was genuinely fearful of this and um, heavily censored any images of my <clears throat> naked body and also because I work in communities where it might not be appropriate though it was in no sensational way and it was within a context of performance art. I performed in Franco B's swing work, um, Naked, and Franco has now long used these images as well as me performing in my own work, notably Body House. I do believe we need to see beyond the naked body. After years of asking where is home, I had an epiphany that my body is my home and subsequently made a piece in 2011 called Body House, which was the start of an ongoing exploration. In the same year, um, I did a life-changing one-to-one residency with prolific performance artist Julie Tolentino in the Mojave Desert, where we explored the idea of body as house in multiple ways through yoga, art, performance, architecture, food, body-based work, in every way imaginable. And this residency totally transformed my relationship to my own body in a life-changing way. I feel like a snail sometimes. I have an affinity with snails. They carry their home on their back. I wish I carried my home on my back. I kind of do. I'm happiest when I'm moving. I know nothing else. To exist in more than one location. To exist in more than one space. Do you have a home? Can you have more than one home? Where is home? Do you feel that you have a voice? Do you feel that you are heard? Do you feel that you have a choice? Where is home? 
Why did the revolution happen? Why am I here? Why do I need to keep asking? Why can't I let go? There is a strong womanist, feminist thread in me because of my family history. There just is. It is part of my history and practice, both in terms of content as well as consciously collaborating with women artists. It's embedded and part of my DNA. And now I'm at the point of wanting it to become even more of a major strand in my practice moving forward. Besides these issues being embedded at the core of my life and family history, they also go back to the beginning of my career when I was working with Women's Theatre Workshop and Max Daffer Clark uh, because of his strong focus of developing women writers. I worked with him on Carol Churchill and April DeAngelis uh, productions working with director Anna Birch on first production of Marina Carr's play Low in the Dark in London um, with Women's Theatre Workshop, um, who also uh, run Aurora Metro Press, who promote women writers, as well as working with director Anna Furs when she was artistic director of uh, Payne's Plough. Both Anna's uh, were strong feminist directors influenced by the politics of the 60s. Prior to working with the two Annas, working with Philip Osmond as a young theatre director of 19, um, Philip mentored me whilst I was still a student and encouraged me, recommending me to people like Anna Foes, who gave me one of my first paid jobs at Payne's Plough, as her assistant director. Philip was one of the co-founders of Gay Sweatshop uh, alongside Noel Gregg and I was blessed to work with both of them and would say that they're two of the first feminist men that I encountered. I also directed Nawal El Sadawi's 12 Women in a Cell, working with women writers as a director of new writing and devising interdisciplinary theatre works in the 90s with uh, writers like Sarah Clifford, uh, Louise Warren and Claire Bailey, all prolific feminists. I can't deny where I come from. I occupy more than one space, always outside of everything. Cultural fusion or confusion, mix up. My home is on my back, a nomad. I don't have a nation or a flag. There are no shapes or colors that represent me, no boxes that I can tick. I come from a place that became a fairy tale in my lifetime. I don't belong anywhere. No, I belong everywhere. I don't belong anywhere. No, I belong everywhere. The world is mine. I belong everywhere. I organized a really powerful performative event a few years back when I was working as artistic associate uh, of the Red Room called Women's Edition. We wanted to look at where feminism is today taking an intergenerational, intersectional approach, also involving feminist men. Like with all causes, feminism needs to take an intersectional, intergenerational approach, in my opinion. There's so many inequalities in this world of art, not just around women. Again, patriarchal system not serving any of us. So many wrongs committed. We are stepping backwards in the world since 1980s, beginning of the neoliberal project, which is why the systems and structures are in such a mess and we're living through this political chaos. The fact that we're in a patriarchal model is ruining everything, every sphere, and we need to find ways of pushing back on patriarchy. 
The patriarchal model and approach is informing everything and it really does not serve us, as I say, nor Mother Earth. We're all feminine and masculine energies, regardless of our gender. We need to tap into more feminine energies, regardless of gender, moving towards matriarchal models to reconnect with Gaia, Tara, Mother Earth, incorporating more female energies to create more unity and harmony for the Earth. If you're an artist or creative, bringing, exploring those subjects in your work, finding creative ways of articulating them, and it's not time to be quiet. I really feel that um, the role of the, the artist is to find ways of speaking out against inequalities and uh, injustice and to be a political instrument with a small p and indeed taking action based on your means and challenging existing power structures and uh, status quo i mean you don't have to be an artist but as um, a person just thinking about what you stand for and what you're passionate about and and how you can change that